You're watching PM Agenda. Time to talk American politics. We're joined by Bruce Walpe and Tom Switzer, who we uh, usually are to talk about American politics. Peter Beattie as well <laughs> is with us this afternoon, a former uh, Premier in Queensland. But also, uh, Peter, to remind me the exact title, you were for some years uh, a, uh, a trade rep in, um, in, in uh, New York as well. I was. I spent uh, two years in LA, in fact, David, as a trade representative. I then spent three years in North Carolina and two years in New York. And developed a love, with, as many uh, do, of, of US politics. Yeah. And a great, so a great American minute, accent. Followed it every day. <laughs> That's right. I want to start with the uh, Iran nuclear deal. Um, we heard the Israeli ambassador earlier, and they are amongst the fiercest critics of this. Let me just set this up by playing a little of President Obama. He spent a long time, I think it was more than an hour, in a press conference fielding questions on this overnight our time. Here was a little of it. This deal makes our country and the world safer and more secure. It's why the alternative no limits on Iran's nuclear program, no inspections, an Iran that's closer to a nuclear weapon, the risk of regional nuclear arms race and a greater risk of war, uh, all that would endanger our security. That's the choice that we face. If we don't choose wisely, I believe future generations will judge us harshly. So, Bruce, let me start with you on this. He, he's uh, answering critics by saying, what's the alternative? Yes. Um, what, what do you make of this deal? Uh, first, I was in Washington on Tuesday morning when he announced the deal, and it was an electrifying uh, moment. I put it on a par with President Carter recognizing the People's Republic of China and, and, and unrecognizing Taiwan as legitimate government of China. That, that's and significant. I believe it's that, that significant. And, uh, and the president, what you see here is the president fully across the brief. He, uh, last week, he, he cleared the week so that he could stay in the closest contact with uh, Secretary of State Kerry and the negotiating team. And, and you can tell from how he uh, answered in the questions in the media conference, he knows it thoroughly. He has mastered it. He is convinced that it is in the national security interest of the United States because the alternative, he says, is war. And he doesn't see any other, he believes that a uh, deal is effective in blocking all pathways to a nuclear Well, isn't, isn't an alternative to stick with what we've got? Sanctions uh, that are pretty tough, that are hurting the Iranian economy. He, I think he would argue that the Iranians won't stick with what they got. And right. that they break out. And they say, well, this isn't getting us anywhere. It's not relieving us of sanctions. And so we will go for the nuclear weapons sooner rather than later. We'll, we'll, they wouldn't be that bold about it. We'll protect all our options. Mm. So I think Obama's appreciating what is good in the, long, in the short, medium, and long term and saying this is the best that can be done. All right. Well, the, the politics of this uh, in the U.S. Are, are very interesting. Tom Switzer, uh, what are your thoughts on, you know, it is hailed by the Obama administration as uh, the most significant diplomatic achievement he's had. Um, where does it leave things politically, do you think, mm. in the U.S.? Well, there are a lot of concerns in the U.S. Congress, not just Republicans, but many Democrats and many former secretaries of state. Henry Kissinger and George Shultz, both in their mid-90s, uh, penned a very important op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal not so long ago, raising all sorts of doubts about the deal. But look, um, although the Republicans more or less will do everything they can to oppose the deal, there won't be enough votes in the Congress to override a presidential veto. So I think it's fair to say this is a done deal. And I think all things considered, it's the prudent thing to do. Uh, you mentioned how this is the better alternative to the other options being floated about. It's better than the sanctions regime, which frankly won't endure. And it's certainly better than another preventive war in the Persian Gulf. Uh, that, as we saw in Iraq in 2003, Libya in 2011, is fraught with the danger of unintended consequences. The other thing to bear in mind, and this is a sideshow at this stage, but I think over time you might see the Americans having a closer strategic relationship with the Iranians insofar as that they share a common enemy and they are pursuing the old diplomatic dictum, the enemy of my enemy is my mm. friend. And of course the enemy here is the Islamic yeah. State Sunni jihadists, a very point made by Julie Bishop when she went to Tehran in late April. Yeah, well she's uh, been amongst the few Western diplomats <coughs> really reaching out uh, like that to Iran. Peter Beattie, what are your thoughts on this deal and, well, the, the difficulties as Tom points out, uh, Obama's likely to have in the US over this in, in Congress? David, part of the problem with American politics is that it's basically broken. I mean, 
you might think that Australian politics is pretty stupid. Well, I have to say American <laughs> politics is even worse. The partisan divide really has been the worst probably in American history, at least for some time. I mean, there's always been partisanship, but people have been able to, as they say, reach across the aisle and, and come to some understanding in the American interest, in the national interest. It seems now that as a result of the Tea Party and uh, some of the extreme elements in the Republican Party, and indeed some in the Democrats, let me not be partisan about this, it's very difficult to get cooperation. So yes, he'll have a tough time uh, but, of it. But, but Peter, but sorry, agree. what about the Trade Promotion Authority? I mean, they, these were the Republican leaders joining forces with President Obama, as we've discussed on this program. Doesn't that show the system's not broken? <laughs> oh, that's a pretty rare exception, Tom. I think you'll find it. And all, you, all you've got to do is look at when they closed down the, you know, the budget, they basically decided not to pass money. They fought on everything. It was like a hen scratch. I mean, I've got to say, I, I think it's even worse than Australian politics. But let me come back to the point. I think he had to do this deal. Uh, one of my good contacts told me that re realistically, and I, you know, I assume this is true, that the Iranians were actually within six months or, or a little more of actually having a bomb. What these inspections basically means is that's very difficult for the Iranians to do. The other thing to remember here, David, is that the Iranian people generally, leaving out the religious aspect of Iranian society, are really quite pro-American. Mm -hmm. And any of the Iranians that you, you talk to or run into, which I've done in the US and elsewhere, are actually generally pro-American. So mm -hmm. I think this is a sensible decision mm -hmm. to make. It's strategically sound and it gives a new circuit breaker perhaps to the Middle East. My only issue is to make sure that Israel's interests are looked after. Well, yeah. Israel's not happy mm. at all. Uh, Bruce, um, it's been a, a somewhat tense relationship between Israel and his best friend, the U.S., for it, some time. It's been very tense. The relationship between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu not is at, at rock bottom. I mean, and I haven't seen anything quite like it in 40 years of uh, looking at the relationship. So th that is a pretty tough situation. Uh, and, and you have two factors conv converging here. Netanyahu, an existential threat from Iran, wants to do everything possible to stop an agreement. Are they but going to ramp up their own decided, nuclear uh, arsenal? Well, uh, uh, I'm sure the Israelis will do whatever they deem necessary. But what, that but, means but, yes. <laughs> but what, they, uh, what Netanyahu is doing is making a political decision to cooperate with the Republicans, and that's where it becomes a major political issue inside the Congress. Yeah. But support for Israel is strong among Democrats as well, and so the Democrats will be split. So but, I agree with Tom. There are, the president will have the votes to sustain a veto if necessary. All right. I want, I want to but talk about a few other things. It's tough. Um, Sorry. I, I, Iran is, is fascinating. It's going to take some time, I yeah. think, to see how the politics and uh, indeed the, um, uh, well, the, the, the regional state of play in the, in the Middle East unfolds on the back of this. But let's talk some of the uh, interesting twists and turns in the, in the presidential race as well this week. Donald Trump. Now, um, a, a lot of people, uh, including I think some of us here, have been treating him <laughs> as a bit of a joke candidate uh, from the start here. But... His favourability ratings are up. Uh, I think he's jumped now to 57%. Uh, he's either at the front or near the front in a lot of the polls of the Republican contenders, and there's about 15 of them, uh, which means he's, he's going to uh, be in the race, clearly, uh, for a while. He's going to have to be taken seriously. He'll no doubt be in some of the debates as well. Tom Switzer. Um, and let me show you this, um, this tweet, though, that uh, has been a little bit embarrassing for him before I get your thoughts, Tom. Um, he sent out this tweet, which is uh, with the hashtag, uh, what was it, Make America Great? again but the image have we got it there let's um let's bring it up if we do here it is the image which you know on, on first blush uh looks fine um there it is uh, donald trump and the and the american flag but the, the 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 soldiers you can see uh down in the bottom corner there they're not american soldiers <laughs> they're actually uh ss <laughs> Oh no! Soldiers. They've, the campaign since apologised for that, but it turns out they have the SS insignia uh, on their shoulders. Uh, Nazi um, uh, soldiers. A, a bit of embarrassment there. But Tom Switzer, <laughs> Donald Trump himself, he's also overnight had to lodge his financial disclosure, and he's boasting that he's worth ten billion dollars. Yeah. Uh, he's the richest mm. guy in the race. He's not going to have a, any trouble with uh, with cash. What's going on here? What, what's the appeal? Well, I suppose it's crudely putting it there's an anti-Washington buzz around America this is all too often evident in the United States but it's there's a real backlash against both parties both Democrats and Republicans and he sees himself as an outsider but that tweet you just showed in fairness I suppose uh, well it's actually just as offensive as the last controversial tweet that he put out which was if 
Hillary Clinton can't satisfy her husband, what makes her think she can satisfy the United States? I mean, yeah. this guy is a real not, clown. Not to mention his he, illegal he's crude, uh, comments he's rude. too. And I would argue, and, and Peter would be in a better position than I to talk about this, he is the Clive Palmer of American politics. He's flamboyant, <laughs> he's a businessman, uh, he's rude, he's crude. Frankly, he's racist. The comments he made about Mexican immigrants a few weeks ago were just beneath the pale. But to answer your broader point, what's happening here is that in a very crowded field, and we might have something like 20 candidates running for the Republican nomination, he has a better chance of standing out. And he does stand out yeah, because he, he says flamboyant things. And he's got a so big, he's going to get 10% of the vote. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I don't think it will last. We'll probably be talking about him for a few more months. But eventually, his bubble will burst, and the main candidates will be more mainstream candidates like Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush and Scott Walter, who also put his hand up yeah, this week. Peter, how, how long do you give the... Uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Donald Trump uh, trajectory here is he going to fizzle out when he says something completely outrageous again or is this going to keep I, going? David I'd be very surprised if we were talking seriously about him by the end of the year he'll be a shooting star and he'll burn up and I think Tom's analogy about Clive Palmer <laughs> is probably true uh, I saw a lot of uh, when I was in the US uh, we saw a lot of him on television frankly and he gets tedious very very quickly and you've got to remember one of the polls I saw David and you may have seen it too his rising star is amongst Republican voters because he's taking this hard line against immigration. You've got to remember a lot of the Republican vote is, is really white males and white yeah. women. And frankly, they don't have enough Hispanics, which is why they don't win the presidency. Mm -hmm. But when the polls put him up against Hillary Clinton, he disappeared. He went actually almost to the bottom of the, of the leading contenders, Bush and others. So, mm -hmm. yes, if you look at the general vote of Republicans, he's doing OK. But then when you put him out to the general populace yeah. against Hillary Clinton, he drops down. David, he'll be a burning, a shooting star, as they say, and he'll disappear. They cannot win, their Republicans, without a significant vote, of, a significant part of the Hispanic vote. And at the moment, Trump wouldn't get it. Uh, as we always have to remind Australian uh, viewers, when it comes to American politics, Bruce, you've got to get out the vote. But getting out the vote to vote against you is not the <laughs> idea. It's not, um, two points. Uh, when, when Donald Trump was attacking Barack Obama's uh, birthright, mm. uh, Republicans loved it. And they didn't stop this guy for saying outrageous things. Well, this has come home to roost. I've never seen Democrats so happy in my life. I think Peter's probably right, but if he doesn't flame out, he will stay in the race until he starts having to spend some serious money uh, the, the, of yeah. his $10 billion. Yeah. And so I think he could be in the race until March. And, uh, okay. and so he might be around for a little while, which would be happy on days to um, here again. On the Democrat side, uh, <laughs> there's been some interesting poll numbers there as well. Bernie Sanders, who you know, no one gave much of a chance when he entered the race against Hillary Clinton for the Democrat nomination. Yes. Uh, but he's now polling pretty well, uh, too. And I see he's also raising some money, nothing like the $45 million that Hillary's raised right. so far. But he's raised 15 That's more than any of the Republicans uh, have raised. Bruce... Um, What's going on with Bernie Sanders? Uh, he's, he, he's having the time of his life and he's, and he's, and he's showing some gr uh, grassroots enthusiasm among Democrats. I actually think that he could win Iowa and New Hampshire. Well, I think we've got an Iowa uh, graphic, poll graphic here where you can see yeah. uh, that he has increased his... Hillary Clinton's flatline, though, so it's not eating away at her favourability, but... His personal uh, numbers are going up. But uh, I, th I think he could. I think he could win Iowa, Bruce, and New Hampshire. Bruce, are you serious? Do you think that Bernie oh, yes. Sanders could beat Hillary in Iowa and New Hampshire? I do. Uh, really? but, but that doesn't mean that she's not going to get the nomination. She said it might She will kill him in the huge embarrassment the, for her. Though, in the industrial it? states and, and the, the parties with her. Iowa, and New Hampshire, are sort of discreet um, yep. contests. But yeah, I do think it's quite possible. Tell you what, wow. should Joe Biden? be thinking, hello, maybe I need to nominate you. I, I, spoke, with, I spoke with some no. people very, I spoke with some people yesterday in Washington, very close to Joe Biden, and he's, he is struggling he, with the, the terrible yeah. personal loss that he had, the death of his son yeah. a month ago. I don't see him entering the race. Okay. All right. Well, we got that from the horse's mouth, uh, or as <laughs> close to it. Tom, uh, what do you think about Bernie Sanders, uh, firstly? Why is he starting to gain momentum and how far will that go? Well look there's been so much media commentary about how the Republican Party in the Obama era has lurched to the right on a wide range of public policy issues and that's broadly true but what's been missing in the media narrative is the Democrat Party has been lurching to the left 
not just on trade, as we saw last month when they tried to torpedo their own president on trade promotion authority and free trade agreements in Asia and Europe, but on financial regulation and various other issues. They are partying like it's 1969. <laughs> so they want a candidate who's going to talk their language. Yeah. Bernie Sanders is a socialist. He feeds them the ideological red meat that Hillary Clinton, instinctively at least, is incapable of giving yep. them. But again, uh, like we were saying with Donald Trump, he's, he's not going to appeal to the no, general I think electorate. That's right. but Peter, the question uh, is, is did, whether did, he'll be a stalking horse for a more credible well, maybe. mainstream liberal uh, politician like Elizabeth Warren. Yeah, there's still no. plenty of time for someone else to get in the race. Peter, is Hillary Clinton, uh, should she be worried? I don't think so at this stage, and I think uh, Elizabeth Warren is a very more, much more credible candidate than Bernie Sanders. I agree with Tom's assessment. I think Bernie will disappear too. He'll appear, he'll, he'll appeal in the short term, but long term will have problems. There's one thing you've got to remember here, though, David. I was in the U.S. in 2008 when the Hillary Clinton uh, Obama campaign was going on. And while Hillary's got enormous resources, and I hope she's learnt from this campaign, she lost those primaries because, frankly, she ran a shocker. She really did run a shocker. And I don't, I'm not convinced yet that she is a really good campaigner, which will sound strange, but she was run down by Obama. He, had well, he, he was an outstanding campaigner. He did, he did, and he, is, he was an outstanding campaigner, and none of the people in the field are, are in Obama's class. I admit that, and I believe that Hillary will get there. I don't think there's any issue about that. But I just say that she'll have a few hiccups along the way because she's not a good as, as good a campaigner as some people think. And I was surprised in 2008 just how bad she was. All right, look, we are nearly out of time. I just want to get um, some thoughts on the MH17 uh, anniversary. There's a memorial service tomorrow morning in Canberra that we'll be bringing to you on Sky News. But um, th this policy question, Tom Switzer, still remains and, and a policy challenge for Barack Obama. Mm. Uh, what to do mm. uh, about Russia in mm -hmm. particular and, uh, and what's still going on between Russia and, uh, and Ukraine? Well, you're absolutely right. That strategic standoff that sparked that military blunder a year ago it not only remains unresolved, but there is a danger that it could spiral into a serious Russian-US confrontation more perilous than anything we saw during the Cold War. The Congress, the Pentagon are encouraging the White House to give heavy armoury and aid to the Ukrainians to fight the Russians. This is a no-win strategy, simply because the Russians, by virtue of their own border, they have military supremacy over NATO. So if the Ukrainians ramp it up, and ignore the ceasefire set at Minsk in February of this year, this was one charted by the European leadership of Merkel and Hollande, then the Russians will quadruple their efforts and will have a spiralling confrontation, perhaps even a Cuban Missile Crisis style uh, mm. uh, controversy. So I think the President has a lot to ponder here. Does he go with the Congress and the Pentagon, stand up to Putin, or does he give his opponent an avenue of escape? That's pretty serious stuff, it, it, uh, equating it to the it Cuban is. Missile Crisis. Yeah, sure. Cool. But there was one, one uh, important variant that happened. In the negotiations over Iran, of which Russia yeah, was exactly. part of the P5, Russia played an extremely helpful role mm, at yeah. the end to close the deal. They did. And I think that'll temporize Yeah, but, 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 but it's is, but is Iran's nuclear uh, plans one thing, Ukraine for Russia. As long is, as the, is pretty important. Uh, it is, and, but as long as the status quo is roughly maintained, mm. then I think this can be put on ice for well, a little bit. I think Bruce is right. Just quickly, I think the West needs Russia more than we sometimes care to realise. Yeah. Yeah, all right. yeah. I think the other thing, David, just quickly, Bruce is right, and I would hope that Obama would, uh, maybe he should listen to Tom, and that is give uh, Putin a way out. There was good relations in part <laughs> of the Iranian deal, and they couldn't have done it without the Russians, frankly. Mm -hmm. We better send. Uh, we better send the president a link to this. Uh, this <laughs> yeah, Tom, Tom for Tom. Tom, Tom get to the world's Ukraine while you can. <laughs> uh, we, we better wrap it up. Um, Peter Beatty, Tom Switzer, Bruce Wolpe. Thank great you. to talk Thank to all you. of you. Thank great you very much for that. Uh, love the Peter, chat, Bruce. We're going to take a quick break, and then it's time for the.